Hi, I'm Bill Bensley. I'm here in Bangkok at my painting studio. And I am really looking forward to having a nice little chin waggle with you. Well, thank you so much, Bill. I I'm Juliet Kinsman, and I can't wait to talk to you about how we can travel better for Conde Nast Traveler. For me, this is, these are the things I think of you. Artist, designer, gardener, historian, anthropologist, um, <laughs> fantasy, fantasy creator, shopaholic. These are all things that come to mind. <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of every single one of those. <laughs> That's how I would introduce you, but how would you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm a humble gardener. To me, actually, above everything else and through all of these things, you're a storyteller. You're a storyteller about places, um, about people, and particularly in Asia. And I think, you know, I think people, please just tell, tell me all of your, you have so many stories. This is, this is time for you to tell me all your stories. Tell me a little bit about your journey to, to because it's obviously been 30 years of, of doing what you do. And I, I really loved your sustainability, your white paper. And I think your spirit of generosity, the fact that you open sourced all your learnings from 30 years for everyone, either in the industry or beyond to learn from was a, was a great thing to do. But tell me about, you know, tell me about those 30 years. Um, well, you know, they've gone by like that, bang. And uh, I, I can't believe how incredibly lucky and how incredibly, what a great life I've had. Um, or, or having rather, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I started, I started out, as I told you before, when we met in Bali, as I started out doing a lot of projects in Bali, became a Baliophile. Um, that was 30 years, 30 plus years ago, 37 years ago, uh, and learned the languages, etc., and then did a lot of landscape work. And then after that, um, I was doing landscape work for, uh, around buildings that I didn't particularly like, that I didn't particularly enjoy. So I thought to myself, well, let's hire some architects and do some architecture. And then we did that and we did that really well. And our, my first job ever was the Four Seasons in Malaysia. That was my very first job where we took on all the projects. And then I, then I took on the Four Seasons in Koh Samui and we did the interiors and we just sort of, as you say, made it up as we go along. Usually it's annoying to have bits of noise in the background, but because I know it's caused by adorable puppies, <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. These are my dogs. This is Jesse, and that's Frankie Valley, and this is Tommy Bahama. So I'm sorry, well, so, so tell me, um, so, so seasons, first project, second, second project, Four Seasons, uh, yeah. And then, you know, we went on to, you know, now we've done 14 Four Seasons and maybe 230, 240 different uh, hotels all over the world. I just, uh, just got a new project in Antigua, uh, Antigua and Barmuda, and I'm going to do a 60 room hotel that encapsulates the history of Antigua. Uh, every room is different. Um, Historian, big time. Uh, I'm loving this project. It's going to be uh, maybe the best thing we've ever done. Maybe. So I think, you know, it's important to acknowledge in terms of storytelling, uh, recent times have turned the world upside down. And, you know, it's heartbreaking for all those affected. But also, I think it's exciting because we've realized we need to tell some new stories. How, in terms of Antigua and the Caribbean, that's really interesting in terms of telling that story. Um, has your perspective changed? Well, you know what? That's a good question is that, um, you know, Antigua and the Caribbean has a very sordid history. And I think what we want to do on this one is that um, we want to take a fresh look at and only look at the, what they call the golden years of Antigua, which might be uh, from 1930 to 1970, something like that, and to really concentrate on Antiguans as opposed to the British colonial. Uh, and if you look in Wikipedia, there's 
you know, this much about the Tainos, the, the Indians oh, that yeah. were there. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. That much? It's an amazing and that's story. That's an amazing story. And I want to build a whole wellness center around the Taino medicines, et cetera. At least that story. And then there's that much about the British. And then there's this much about the Antiguans. And then after that, there's that much about the British. But I want to reverse that on the head, right? Reverse that. I mean, Sound good? Yeah, oh, it sounds so good. Because actually, you know, I imagine a lot of those people don't, you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't protected or saved, let alone their culture. I mean, how do you do that? Do they still exist within Antiguan uh, society? The, you mean the, no, the, the ancient Indians were all uh, decimated in the 17th century by the, the Spanish, but we, we know enough about them. And yesterday I was on a Zoom call with the doctor of archeology span who is an Antiguan. And, and when I get there at the end of the month, he's gonna, he's gonna walk me through all of the details of what he knows about uh, the, the ancient history of Antigua. And so what do we do to sort of reframe colonialism in this time? Because as we know, um, exactly as you said, it was a devastating time. So how do you, you know, tell those stories and look at, tell the real story? Well, you know what, we've just started this. And I'm not sure that, um, unlike Capella Ubud, where I told the real story of, of of the Dutch invading to Bali four different times and how they were thrown back, et cetera. That was a, a happy ending. Not much of a happy ending with, uh, with, the, uh, with the slave trade there, except for the emancipation of, tra of slavery and King uh, William IV, who, who, who began that in motion because he was part of um, the Navy when he, when he went, was in Antigua. So maybe that's a good part of the story. Let's rewind actually um, to your beginning of your relationship with Cambodia, because mm -hmm. you know, in terms of how to travel better, I think over the years, I mean, I've got a little, a little tiny pamphlet here on some of the projects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think this that's is a good book, record. by the way. Pardon? It's, it's a good book, by the way, and it's sold out. Oh, so you, look, it's a metaphor for you, though. Larger than life, big, <laughs> really, really more is more. So, you know, there's, there's some incredible, I mean, you just go through this. There's so many incredible, almost unbelievable scenes. Uh, um, but, you know, I think, therefore, because it's so over the top and theatrical and flamboyant, people wouldn't necessarily have associated you with with sustainability. So, so please tell me about your beginning of your relationship with Cambodia, because actually it's hearing about you and, and your, you know, exploring yourself that I found so incredibly touching. Um, my, the first time that I went to Cambodia was soon after the, soon after the country opened. So that was sometime in the nineties, I think. And uh, I went there on invitation of my good friend, Sukun Champrida, because uh, he wanted us to work on the Hotel de la Paix, which I think you visited. I haven't, um, I, I know it, I know oh, it. Yeah. You haven't, but you know it, yeah. And now it's the Park Hyatt. Uh, and uh, he took me out to the countryside and I saw a family of seven uh, kids, seven children and mom, and they were sleeping on, this is a true story, they were sleeping on top of a, a pile of roots about a meter high, just to keep, just to keep them off of the, off of the wet soil. Um, the, each of the kids seemed to be about a year apart from each other, and the youngest one was maybe two, and he had an extended stomach. We later named him Happy Boy, because he was constantly smiling. Uh, but he had an extended stomach from malnutrition. And that whole experience just kicked me in the gut. And, uh, and I, I still uh, get um, upset when I think about it. We could, because Cambodia is Thailand's neighbor, and we are so rich compared to the Cambodians. 
that whole experience of meeting this family really upset me. And I, and it, it and I, I swore to myself at that time that I would try to help these people as much as I possibly could. So that was the catalyst to, um, uh, to starting these hotels and starting the, starting the foundation, starting the school, et cetera. And since then that, the, that, that lady, that mother that had no husband, uh, since then, now she has two houses, one sewing machine, a vegetable garden, all the kids go to school, they've all got bicycles, they've got water, uh, and guess what? The husband came back, <laughs> and he's living there, and they're all, they're all a big happy family now, so. That, that first meeting with the family, the, I understood that the kids were walking the, actually the oldest two girls, they were walking about five kilometers to bring uh, a bucket of water a piece back to this pile of sticks. Uh, so that was my first understanding, my first realization that people, you know, everyone doesn't have a tap, right? <laughs> and, and then Sukun and, uh, figured out a very inexpensive way to build a, a well. And, um, we got this very, really foolproof system going, and we could we figured out how to build these wells for about a hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty dollars a piece. Um, since then, we've built three thousand or more wells, which is which is great. Um, and a lot of the the uh, clients, a lot of the guests that come to Shintamani and Siem Reap, uh, they'll they'll pay for a well or two, and we'll put their name on it and. And then and make a make a fun ceremony. It's a really good way of, of kids learning how exactly what I learned that everyone doesn't have a tap, right? So now my big issue now is clean water because still five percent of the newborns that are in Cambodia they die because of dysentery because that water that they can get freely now isn't clean. So we've I've made a deal with Kohler and we've bought thousands of these really simple plastic bottle here, plastic bottle here, filter in the middle, you put in the dirty water and it comes out clean. That's really working well now. So we're in our third or fourth year of doing that clean water. And I would say what you always talk about, obviously, is not just creating these theatrical, wonderful places to spend time, but actually you really encourage people, or you certainly do it yourself, is to get out there into local communities and not just stay in this bubble of luxury. Well, that, that's exactly right, Annette. I, can I share with you some of the, the way that I travel better, where I think the way I travel better? Yeah. Um, uh, about just before COVID, I spent some, uh, about a month traveling through Papua, which is a part of Indonesia on the west coast of Papua New Guinea, uh, or some, uh, sometimes it's called Irian Jaya. And for every single day there, I didn't just stay on the boat and drink margaritas. Well, I did a bit of that, but I, I went out and I met um, dozens of people. And, and what I do to travel better is that I would, I would draw, let me turn this around. I would draw um, all the people that I see. So this is, this is the fellow on the boat. This, this here is a place called Mai Mai. And the really interesting part about Mai Mai was that they made these palm trees with, and they painted actually all their palm trees they painted in blue and white like this and then these were two of the fellows that were hanging around there and that they were also on the boat mm -hmm. and then i went to the next island mm -hmm. and then it was full of children many many children and so i thought well shoot i, I need to i need to get um the next island i need to get some need to get some lollies but we would go fishing. We would go not fishing, but uh, uh, scuba diving uh, and, and snorkeling. So I, I did all of this from memory. 
This is a good one. By being, um, having subjects in front of you from foreign lands uh, really allows you the time to be able to interact with them properly, to really be able to find out their backstories. And that, those backstories, you know, the, the backstories, <laughs> literally the backstories, um, are the most important things that you can take away. Tell me in terms of, you know, we're going to travel a lot less now, we know that. Hopefully we'll, we'll invest much, well, not just invest, but really enjoy more time in the planning. And when we go away, maybe we'll go away for longer. You know, Asia, I mean, that's such a broad continent. There's, you know so much of Asia. And, and why should people really, really plan trips to Asia? What's so magical about Asia? Every single summer, I go to Mongolia. And I go to the Russian border and fish. I, I catch, I fly fish. And I catch anywhere from, in a day, anywhere from 50 to 86 is my record. Trouts, trout that are 22 inches long, which is one trout like that, yeah, one trout. And uh, we, uh, how to say, I belong to a group that's been doing this for many years and we pay this particular for this particular access to a river and we pay for the the rangering of that of that river during the winter time too so the russians don't come down and empty the river um in eight years that we've been doing it we've never we've never hurt a uh, even one trout everything is catch and release on barbless hooks no bigger than my fingernail um so it's it's a way of also uh, protecting the environment also by being in it. And of course, when we go through it, I go through for a month, I travel over 400 kilometers. And during that time, I don't see one other person. What better, what better um, medicine for COVID than that? It's interesting you made the point that essentially it's an act of conservation by you spending time there and your, your yes. affiliation with that as, as a, patron almost. Um, tell me yeah. more about what you've done with your, your projects in terms of conservation. Uh, well, yeah, conservation is very close to my heart in that uh, about eight years ago, uh, Sukuna and I, we purchased a piece of property a little bit bigger than Central Park in the Southern National Forest of Southern Cambodia with the idea of uh, conservation. But I also wanted to explore the idea to do something similar to what we did at Four Seasons in, in um, Chiang Rai, the elephant camp. And that worked out, um, has worked out, my number one hotel, Kananask, my number one hotel for three years in a row. So we had the, had the, how to say, the experience of being able to do something as wonderful as that. And, but then this property that we bought was many times better. Um, with the river that runs through the whole property, very wide river, huge waterfalls, incredible place. But it also was very much, is very much under threat for, for logging and for the hunting of wildlife and still is. Um, right through COVID, um, we we're still paying for the rangers, and they're not cheap, um, to, to keep the poachers at bay. Um, so that's and poaching is up very much a in these times. Uh, as a result of, of us not being able to travel, I presume there's less revenue coming into these communities and areas. So therefore, po poaching spikes because they need access to, or they want access to animals. So it's so important for people. To, you know, sometimes they don't really think about the knock-on effects of them not being able to have a holiday. Yeah, we've we've been. Uh... But luckily, by not having, uh, how to say, I, I, haven't, I haven't fired anybody, so that means that we have more people that normally would be serving gin and tonics are out there as rangers, right? So we've been able to balance that, and our, our, um, uh, we don't think we've, we've gone backwards, so, which is great. Wow, so you've redeployed 
people who are on property serving guests because they don't have those responsibilities to actual hands-on conservation roles. And, and also we're now developing um, a chicken farm uh, and a veggie, veggie farm and they've made the compost heaps. Um, so we're doing, going back to all the things that I write about sustainability. So now we have the time in order to do the things that are close to my heart the way I grew up, right? So. You know, it's so funny because I, for many years, have reviewed or written about luxury hotels. And everyone else will obviously be talking about the thread count or quite rightfully be um, talking about perhaps your design or all those beautiful things. But I hear the word compost and that's what gets me excited. <laughs> the details behind the scenes of what you're doing. So tell me, tell me about that. And also do tell us more about the sustainability. Uh, wait, it's called the sensible, sensible sustainability solutions paper that you did. There's nothing sensible about you. So tell me. <laughs> uh, I about last end of last year I, I wrote this sat down and wrote as succinctly as possible I am you know not like you I'm not a professional writer but I I wrote all the all of the ideas that I think should go into the manuals of of Four Seasons of Marriott of of six senses, et cetera. Let me back up a bit. Um, I'm a, I design, I'm an architect for hotels. So every time I get a hotel, I get a design manual uh, that tells me what a Marriott wants to be, what a six senses wants to be. And I have hundreds of them. And I, I went through basically all of them and very, very few of them talk anything about sustainability. So I thought to myself, what if we put together a 20 page, very simple insert, white paper, doesn't have to be Bensley, doesn't have to be anything about me. What if we, and, I, and we send it to all of the companies all over the world, and a lot have now incorporated them, to stuff it into the back of their building standards. That's what they call them. And I've gotten tremendous uh, uh, feedback from lots of people saying, hey, your paper really gave me some good ideas. We're gonna do this and this and this. So. That, in a nutshell, that's it. So you're affecting change. It's really, really important. Going back to those details, um, can you, obviously you're someone connected to nature and talking about gardening. I mean, I love compost because it represents to, within sustainability that idea of a closed loop system and nature being the best example of that, the circular economy. There's no such thing as waste in nature. You obviously, really, really emphasize uh, upcycling in all your design, which is giving things a longer life. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, you, you, were, you were quoting, or you were talking about Capella Ubud. Many of that, uh, you know, the beds and many of the furniture is in there that were, were all upcycled, um, the side tables and so forth. They don't look like it because they've been really polished. And I, I think it's important that we, that we don't have to buy every single damn thing brand new. Uh, in fact, um, I want to do a hotel, and I've yet to get a, a client to do this, but I want to do a hotel that's 100% recy recycled and upcycled. I think that would be marvelous. Something you also talk about, which is close to my heart, is obviously the need to uh, alert people to how much greenwash is out there. And what does greenwash even mean? We hear the term and obviously it was, came about when a New Zealand um, guy back in the 80s, I think, was at a hotel and he saw those little signs that we all know so well, please use your towels again because we're doing our bit for the environment when you know really that hotelier thinks, yes, do your bit and save me money on housekeeping. Therefore it's great. Right. right. Exactly, so, yeah, right. Talk to me about greenwash. Well, I, I, I'm proposing uh, that in every you know, 217 countries around the world, that greenwashing um, should be a mandatory five-year uh, sentence in the jail. In terms of your sustainability paper, there were really three main hallmarks, which I really loved. One is build with purpose. The other is think locally and sustainably. And third, build sensibly. Build sensibly, not build sensibly. 
Um, <laughs> so um, tell me what, t you know, elaborate. Sh tell me about some projects that really exemplify that. I wrote them to be addressed to both owners and to architects and to hotel companies, hoteliers. And I didn't just talk about how good it is to be, to, to be sustainable. But in the paper I talk about, I, I write to that the monetary role, the monetary effect, because nobody will want to do anything that's green if it just costs them money. So I, I, I for one example, you asked me for an example for the, the Marriott in JW Marriott in um, Phu Quoc in Vietnam, we call the Mark University. Uh, based on a, a turn of the century university. Uh, we, after year two of operating, where we were going through almost a million bottles per year, uh, we finally got the money, which was uh, something like $37,000. We finally got the money for bottling plant and enough bottles. And that has, we figured out that, we figured out now, this was some time ago, we figured out now that the payback was 10 months. And if a, if a- ROI, if it's it, simple. It's dumb, it's dumb, it's dumb, stupid, simple. And, and if, say, if, a, if a, a, a company comes to me or an owner comes to me and says they, they want to build a hotel and I can tell them I can give them a 10 month, 10 month payback, yeah, let's do it. But when you talk about sustainability and, and you know let's get rid of the plastic oh well that's sort of a green thing we can do that later um and that those are the sort of things that just really tick me off what would you say to the luxury traveler how can they travel better i i think for sure it's about um asking the questions uh you know you've heard this many times before but to ask the questions about you know what what's where you know the places you're going to choose to go you know what are they doing for the community do they have a purpose do they um do they do anything about conservation are, are they are they putting back anything that i mean that's 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 an obvious thing um but also i think the way that i travel is 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 almost unique in, in today is that I go out and I, I really sit with people and get to know people and find out their backstories because I like to paint. So I think that's, that, that's more uh, fulfilling. That, side, that way of traveling is more enjoyable than flying on a private jet for me. So Bill, thank you so much for inviting us into your home in Bangkok. What an incredible thing to do. Thank you for being, thank you for being not the world's best cameraman, but for, for being a magnificent <laughs> master of every other <laughs> creative talent. <laughs> okay, good night. Good night.